On this show, we talk about how we can help out our local bodies of water. And I'm happy to announce that we are only 95 Patreon supporters away from starting our very own 501c3 nonprofit, Casting for Conservation. Our mission with Casting for Conservation will be helping supplementally fish stock local bodies of water that could use the help. Whether it's stocking smallmouth bass in a river that's had a major fish kill or potentially adding F1 largemouth to the Potomac River to help improve catch rates. Furthermore, Casting for Conservation will also be seeking to help out with boat ramp facility restoration. There are so many boat ramps and facilities in this area that really could use some love. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Senkos or a jackhammer chatterbait, Patreon supporters will receive 5% off their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, They'll receive a percentage off their orders to Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Tackle, 10% off their orders to Tiger Crankbaits, 10% off their orders to Catoctin Rods. Members will receive membership-only content, access to our private Facebook community. They'll be entered to monthly fishing photo contest giveaways. And starting in October, we're going to be doing online fishing tournaments as well. Please, if you feel like supporting, we're only 95 Patreon supporters away from starting Casting for Conservation. Link in the episode description down below. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia, and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Baits Online, located in Mount Airy, Maryland. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And and this is something when I started this show, I always like to try to have the imagination of a kid and look at something and be like, is this something interesting? And I was driving past Kerr Reservoir and looking at this massive dam. And it's a simple question, but I think it's overlooked is like, humans built that thing. And, and what does it take not only to build it, but maintain it? And, and it almost reminds me of an old show I watched as a kid called Modern Marvels. And, but then really, I wanted to actually get people on the show who not only take care of, of the dam itself, but can also talk a little bit about the lake and its environment and how that's developed over the years. And so I really want to just thank you to, to Michael and Bill for coming on the show here. I really appreciate you guys. No problem. Yeah, appreciate you having us. And I, and I guess based on our screen, we'll start from my, my right, which would be, uh, Michael, just like, what is your, your role with the Army Corps of Engineers in Kerr Reservoir? Yeah, so my specific role here at John H. Carr is operations project manager, which just essentially entails overseeing all of the authorized purposes that the project was built for um, from Congress and making sure that those purposes are carried out as they were intended um, based under the based under the original authorization. Okay. How long have you been doing this for? I've been working for the Corps for 27 years. Um, started out as a conservation biologist, um, moved into a um, shoreline ranger position here at CAR, chief of shoreline, and then advanced to the position I'm in now as the operations project manager. Oh, wow. And then, and then Billy, you're up. <laughs> Tell the audience Great. at home. No. Yeah, no, yeah, no problem. Um, I'm the chief of natural resources here. And um, what I deal with basically is the fish and wildlife management around the project and the forest management around the project. Uh, we have 26 wildlife management areas that we manage and you know, 50,000 acres of land that we manage uh, for wildlife and for timber. Um, and I've been with the Corps uh, about 12 years, and I've been in this position about a year now. Oh, wow. I, we, we, that's so cool that I was able to get both of you on this show to be able to attack this from both sides. And, and really just because I'm so excited to get into this now. Could, could you give just a, a little brief history, um, and this is for either of you, about the construction of, of the dams? And it, was it just the vision to do the one, or was Roanoke Rapids and Gaston, was that all kind of packaged together yeah, so, and, and just to take a step back, you know, uh, when I was talking about our authorized purposes here at John H. Carr, just so everybody knows that first and foremost was flood control. Hydropower is, uh, was a secondary. Then uh, recreation, fish and wildlife conservation, water, water supply, and low flow augmentation downriver below Roanoke Rapids. So, that's that's the authorized purposes for Congress for the project to be here. Now, how it came to be originally is early on in the in the 30s, um, 
the Corps was tasked with doing a study of the Roanoke River and its tributaries to see how we could control the flow, but also generate hydroelectric power um, and provide reliable, cheap power to the, to the region. From that 1934 study, it went to Congress. Um, funding wasn't authorized at the time for the project construction. But in 1940, there was a significant flood in the Roanoke River Basin caused at the time caused $5 million in damage um, throughout the Roanoke River. And that spurred Congress to look at that study that was done in 1934 again. And under the 1944 Flood Control Act at that point, they authorized the construction of both John H. Carr and hmm. Philpott Reservoir. Now, originally, they had planned to build 11 projects throughout the Roanoke River Basin. Wow. Um, yeah, so it was a significant number of projects that they had planned for. Only the two were funded, Philpott and Bassett, Virginia, and then John H. Carr Reservoir here in Boynton, Virginia. And it to, to it your, is to so interesting. Question, it was yeah, so interesting that's 1940, earlier, yeah, wow. Um, Gaston, Gaston and Roanoke Rapids were part of that plan by the Corps of Engineers. But because funding wasn't authorized and construction wasn't being carried out by the federal government, the power companies lobbied Congress to say, if you are if you all aren't going to be able to fund these, we would be happy to construct these from a private standpoint. And that's what happened. Gaston, both. Of course, it's Dominion Power now. It wasn't Dominion at the time, but both Gaston and Roanoke Rapids were constructed with um uh, private, private industry power companies, and several reservoirs above us, um, Leesville, um, Smith Mountain Lake, Heiko Lake, that's the same thing with those reservoirs above us, um, were all private power company lakes that were that did the construction. It, it's fascinating to me when you look at that time period, where it really was like the big lake craze when you think about Theodore Roosevelt and the TVA system of lakes. Um, and, and this all happened, you said 1940, that's when Germany was like marching through France too. And so it, it really takes to put perspective with the resources that was put into this, what was happening around the globe at the time too. It's just, it's fascinating. It is. Now, yeah, it's, um, yeah, they, you know, and that, that was one thing it was to put people to work, um, like many of the civil works projects around the country at that time intended to put people to work, but also provide stability throughout the river basin for industry to develop and provide that cheap, reliable power um, that wasn't always available at the time. As a kid, I would go to a creek and I would always put rocks in the sand to try to make a little dam. And that was with no mathematical skill or geometry. When you look at a lake like this, I and you know you don't you don't have to give us you know a, a three hour lecture, but I guess the mile high view. How do you un, how do they go about making sure the dam is the correct size to where you do not have overflow and you know how far it'll back up? Because I'm assuming while you're zoning the land, pr people probably own that land, correct? Yeah, that's that's correct. And I mean to touch on it with like you said, without getting into into it too deep. Um, you know, they they based the construction off of the in, historic inflows and specifically that 1940 flood. They wanted to build a reservoir that could handle that size flood event, um, which is really a hundred year flood event. You know, you would expect that type of flood once every hundred years. And so that's what they constructed the dam to handle. Um, and specifically where the dam is located, the reason they chose that this location is it was a narrow point in the river that happened to fall between two um, sizable um, bedrock granite. Um, it was oh, uh, interesting. Uh, shorter, you know, less construction was going to be necessary at this point along the river than it might have been at other points in the river. Um, hmm. Even though the dam is is pretty long compared to some, it's twenty seven. 2,780 feet long, so just over a half a mile long concrete dam, and then we have another four miles of earthen dam. Um, so, but the concrete portion itself fell in between two granite outcrops that they could tie into. Um, so that's how they, hmm. they determine not only the size of it, but the location. This was 1940, though, and it'd be, again, I, I've talked about on the show, it's fascinating if you were able to do that now, just the red tape, but was there any 
it probably wasn't in environmental impact studies then like how did that work in 1940 when you think of like because i think of if you have a homeowners association on the shenandoah river the mm -hmm. river keepers are there like the next day i couldn't imagine this in 1940 yeah that's it was probably much easier to do it in 1940 yeah. than it would be today um for several reasons. One, to touch on the environmental, you know, we didn't have NEPA, um, the National Environmental Policy Act. We didn't have these laws now that guide us and direct us in the things that we need to be taking into account and looking at. So the construction at that time was probably smoother to get it through and make it happen than it would be today. I, a project like this might not even happen if it was proposed today. Um, and with that said, you know, we now take steps to make sure that our impact to the environment is minimized through how we operate our water flows out of the dam um, to include doing environmental assessments. When we take on any significant action, uh, we would complete those uh, environmental reviews at this point. Um, and really from the 70s moving forward, that's when we really started focusing in on that and um, making sure we took it into account through any actions we were doing. What has there been a return on the investment for Kerr when it's either hydroelectric or, or any other variables? Yes, definitely. So the project, when it was initially built in the late forties and it was completed in 52, um, the total project cost just under a hundred million and the the return on that investment happened within you know uh, just a few years um wow. generating not between generating hydroelectric power as well as the damages prevented from uh for flood control um so between those two the the return on the investment was seen quickly and you know now we still see return on our investment um even now uh, over over $500 million has been uh, in property has been protected from flood damages um, since it's since the lake's inception. That's crazy. And power generation fluctuates any given year based on how much water we are sending through the turbines. But, you know, um, but that's millions of dollars generated and cheap, reliable power um, any given year as well. And and. With Kerr, it's always been about flood control. And this is where also like the fishing side of it comes in because you always have the doc talk about what people, you know, they, of course, fishermen believe this lake was just built for them, of course. And how dare you lower the level so they can't flip the bushes in April. And I've always found it fascinating from from your perspective, like how does that whole system work? Um, I understand, uh, you know, flow gauges and stuff, living on the Shenandoah River and now the upper Potomac. Do you have like sensors up river to where it's like once it hits a certain flow rate, we need to expect like the water level to rise? Like how does that whole process work? Billy, do you want to touch on that some or you want me to? Well, I mean, I feel like you can go ahead, but I mean, I can briefly <laughs> touch on it. You know, we try to keep um, the lake level in the springtime. Uh, we try to follow a guide curve and that guide curve pretty much um, stays the same year to year um, springtime. Uh, we try to keep it at certain levels. Um, it was 300. Now we try to keep it at 302 um, for several different factors. Um, one being the uh, the largemouth bass spawn, trying to keep water levels up into the areas where they would spawn and then have that extra um, two feet of storage for um, the release of downstream for the uh, striped bass. So we try to follow a curve. Uh, a lot of factors affect that rainfall, drought, um, things like that. But we try to keep it at that rate in order to 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 protect the fishery. So it's it's based and and one of many factors, but it's more based on rainfall than just current flows or things of that ilk upstream. Yeah, yeah. It it so our releases. You know, we dictate our releases any given week based on our inflows, our um, weekly average inflows to the reservoir uh -huh. are how we determine how much water we're going to release downstream any given week. Um, gotcha. So, you know, we don't base it on weather forecast. We base it on actual inflows to your point a minute ago and what Billy was touching on river gauges and so forth. Um, we base it on those inflows, make a declaration of how much water we need to move through the system, 
And then we coordinate that with several entities, but uh, it, to include Dominion Power to make those releases to get the water through the system and take into account all the things we touched on a minute ago, flood control, hydropower, fish and wildlife conservation, water supply, and low flow augmentation downriver. So we take all those things into consideration when we make our declaration to move water downstream. That's so fascinating because I feel like a lot of people just think it's like it's just a massive cartoon lever that you hit and you can adjust it and it's not. It's a huge system. And I, I think that also factors into like how much water it can absorb. And so it seems like you have time to make decisions if there was some kind of crazy El Nino thing that happened. It's not like it's going to breach if you get too much rain. Yeah, it's um, to your point, it's a 50,000 acres of water. And then we have another 55,000 acres of land that surround the lake. So oh, wow. no matter where we are on our guide curve, which is our target lake level for any given point in the year, which does change, we our target changes. What we're trying to manage for changes throughout the year. And I'm not sure that everybody understands that. We don't try to maintain a steady lake level year round. Because we have these different authorized purposes, We mm -hmm. our target does change to accommodate for those purposes. Um, but to your point, the size of the lake, you know, it even a significant rainfall event for us to come up, you know, two feet in a day would be uh, significant. And that mm -hmm. doesn't happen that frequently. So we have time to plan. We have time to coordinate with our partners downstream. And ultimately, in those flood stages, anytime we're in a flood stage, our goal is to maximize our releases, but make sure we're also preventing damage downstream when doing that. Could you hit on that a little bit more about you know, communicating with your partners downstream? Because that's just, again, it's this web of, of, of things that has to happen because just because you release water, it is, you have two more dams that have to be braced for that too. Yeah, that's right. It's so, it's, um, we, we work through many federal state partners. Um, we actually have weekly calls to di discuss what our releases are going to be. Um, and it, it ultimately trying to hit the purpose of why we're here, all those missions that we've mentioned several times now, you know, we will, we determine how much water we need to move through the system based on whatever the given events are for that time of the year. And then we coordinate through Southeastern Power Administration, and then with Dominion Power, who are, we mentioned before, the two dams just below us, Gaston and Roanoke Rapids, to actually schedule those releases throughout the week and the, each day, each day. We're a, we're a peaking power plant here, which means we come online when there's the highest demand for power at any given point during the day. Oh, so it'd be more like the afternoon. I'm assuming like in the summertime, it'd be big because like AC units and people trying to cool their homes, but that's just me yeah. spitballing. Yes. Yeah. Summertime is the probably one in wintertime when it's extremely cold, but wintertime, hot summer months like we're in right now, um, we would, you know, usually when people start getting home in the evenings, they turn on their air conditions, their dryers, their ovens. That's usually late afternoon in the summertime is when we start generating um, to provide that peak demand power. That's interesting. Uh, w w one more question that, um, w one of my fans wanted me to ask is on, on the TVA system of lakes, you have the ability to transverse from one lake to the other. And because this lake was built back in the 1940s, was that ever in the blueprints of having something like that? So you could, you know, go from the sea all the way into Kerr and beyond? No, I don't think that was ever, it was never in the original plans or intent. Um, to your point earlier, you know, with some uh, looking at our environmental impact and how to lessen that with the dams we have in place, we have been looking to see how we can accommodate the fishery, you know, migrations upriver, um, how we can get fish from one side of the dam to the other. And so we have looked at fish ladders and those kind of things. Um, Dominion Power has taken some steps in that regard. So that has become a consideration more so in recent years, the last couple of decades, than it was ever considered for navigation or for the environmental aspects, you know, years ago when they were originally constructed. 
That is interesting because, yeah, I mean, that is becoming more and more of an importance now, especially with the fish ladders. And I know the Conowingo Dam on the Susquehanna is having some um, litigation right now about their fish ladders. I can't imagine that process because let's say, yeah, you're going to green light that tomorrow. It's not happening in a week. Like that's got to be a massive project to go from what, Roanoke to Gaston, then, then, then there. Like that's insane. Yeah, there's, and, and Billy may be able to touch on this some more, but there's, uh, you know, very simple systems that require a lot of manpower. And then you've got the construction of actual fish ladders, which, you know, would be a significant investment in, change to the structure in and of itself that would, you know, you would have to uh, evaluate. And then yeah, I think you said it perfectly. And then now I get to pick on you, Billy, a little bit. Um, Kerr is, I mean, you had the bass open there, the bass master open. Kerr has been a, a vaunted uh, bass lake that people go to years and years. And now you have some invasive species. Um, I've had, you know, Mr. Dr. Bernarski, head of Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources. I've had David Sikorsky on to talk about different invasive species. I think right now there's blueback, Alabama slash spotted bass, and, and maybe some aquatic vegetation. Your job is not easy. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, that's the, the Alabama bass is definitely uh, the one that uh, is going to be probably the most impact to the, to the bass fishery, um, out competing the large mouth and, and all, and, you know, the stunted growth and all, um, you know, the bass fishermen love them because they're so aggressive, but, you know, it really takes, uh, a toll on the large mouth, which obviously get a lot bigger. So, you know, the creel limit, the creel size is probably going to drop and, um, but they're going to, you know, catch the fish. So it's, it's one of those things, but, you know, how do you fix that, uh, is, it's, it's impossible, but yeah, it's uh, definitely a challenge. And then, you know, as, as far as the invasive species, we've we've done a lot of work with invasive species. Um, the big the biggest one was hydrilla. You know, the bass fishermen, the duck hunters loved it. Um, you know, but it is a, a you know an invasive species that we spent a lot of time trying to control. And uh, in actuality, we controlled it so well that we you know went from I don't know fourteen or fifteen hundred acres of hydrilla on the lake, which Oh, you know, so to speak. docks, you know, coves and all and to, to pretty much zero right now. So we're still in the process of, of controlling that. And it's been, it's been a challenge, but it seems to be working well at this point. It's, it's so hard. Like everyone I've been blessed to talk to every biologist. And they said, if they could have one silver bullet, it's like how you can specifically manage vegetation and get it to grow where you want it and where not to have it grow. And cause it's, it's either that or you just nuke it. Like there's no in between. And, it, and it's so frustrating from what your job is because there is no magic bullet to just say, you can stay here, but don't go over near this guy's dock. That's right. That's right. And, you know, and the, the challenge here with the fluctuation and, you know, the loss of substrate and all is trying to get the natives back, back into the system. Um, it's, it's been very challenging. Um, some things we've done with uh, the uh, Virginia Division of Wildlife Resources is we're working on um, trying to reestablish water willow in different places. That seems to be able to to take hold and become established real well, and it does provide you know good habitat anyway for for the uh, fishery. So we're we're working on things that way to try to get you know some to offset the the loss of the hydrilla. Is there any other SAV subaquatic SAV that? that is either in the lake right now or maybe introduced that is native? Well, uh, um, we're doing uh, some work with NC State who have hmm. done the, hydro the hydrilla surveys and they've done some test plots um, around the lake to try to establish um, some aquatic vegetation through uh, submersive uh, devices where they're putting the plants in uh, a substrate and lowering it down to see if it, it, becomes, it can become established. And they're not having a lot of success with that. Um, you know, there is other vegetation uh, around the lake and some names, Chara, Spike Rush, Spatter Dock, but it's very limited. What seems to be working is the water willow, which is probably the least beneficial, but at least it's providing some type of, of habitat for it. Uh, you know, when the hydrilla dropped off, the water willow really exploded around the lake and it seems to be doing well uh, you know, around the lake. Uh, went out with the uh, biologist from the game department here uh, or the, uh, the the division of the division of wildlife resources recently and they were telling me about um uh they took uh 
you know, via GoPros down through the different water, the, wa- the water willow sections and you know, just the amount of aquatic uh, life that was there was, was encouraging anyway. So, And with my li- limited knowledge, uh, water willow also helps with bank erosion too, correct? So it has a absolutely. secondary benefit. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it helps control erosion. It, it actually, in actuality, you know, the deer will actually, you know, feed on it some too. So it has, really? a, yeah, they will. It, it does have a larger benefit, um, but definitely bank erosion and structure uh, for the uh, fishery itself. How how hard is it with the with the different primary reasons for the lake's existence? But then you factor in this annoying subset that is bass fishermen like myself. Um, when you deal with like the fish the fishing spawn and you deal with the water levels they want, and then from your your place, how do, how do you balance that? Because I know with with there was a large mouth virus, if I'm not mistaken, twenty to thirty years ago in Kerr. Uh- Right was around it, 2010. Is it 2010? So 13, okay. Yeah, 2010. Right around 2010 is when it really impacted. And not to say it's gone, but it's definitely, you know, we definitely have rebounded from that uh, significantly here in recent years. So that's, a, I guess, a positive thing. Who, with that lake splitting, Carolina and Virginia, how does that work for stocking or habitat? Or like, is that a coalition between the two? Like, for example, on the tidal Potomac, it's really wonky how it's split into like four or five different sectors. How does it work for the lake? Yeah, um, we have fisheries meeting every year here where we get together and hmm. and discuss things and, you know, different topics from hydrilla and you know, how to control the hydrilla to to um, limits set on the you know, set on the fishery and, uh, you know, licensing how that works in, in both lakes. So, we kind of come together and they collaborate a lot on, on, on many of the decisions that happen here at the lake, but the actual fishery is managed by the two states. So we okay. don't deal with the biology itself of the fishery on, you know, stocking limits, creel limits and things like that. But we do, you know, assist with that and um, help out with different surveys and things that they do here around the lake. That's fascinating. Is there anything coming up then that you guys have meetings for, or you're trying to get done this year? Um, we just did some native uh, vegetation planning here last week. Yeah. Um, they typically do um, gill net surveys in in the fall um, to where they're you know looking at age and and weight of the striped bass mainly, but they do take into account a lot of different fishery of uh, fish. Um, they do those every year, and then um, they do the largemouth bass and and shad uh, uh, electric shock surveys here in the summertime. So those are those are coming up here as well. So we. You know, we work with them and, you know, get the information. Um, they provide a lot of the data to us to where, you know, we at least keeping, you know, keeping up to speed on how things are going here at the Osborne. It is fascinating. Um, you know, you mentioned several times the, the hydrilla and, and the issues with that. And I know on a couple of TVA lakes, one reason they do the drawdown is uh, for the hydrilla issues. Um, and then, of course, the fishing community, community there is like a cult. And so their <laughs> their thought is keep it low and that will help with some of the dock owners. Is is that one of the bigger issues now is with the, the homeowners and the, the hydrilla? What is, what is the main concern for just people that are listening that aren't aware. Yeah. Um, the main concern is it, you know, is exotic species, you know, it, it wasn't here. It doesn't belong at the lake. Um, the, uh, draw down, you know, I asked some, you know, several of the biologists about their thoughts on why it took so long to become established here. Did the draw down impact it? Did it not? And, you know, I've never really gotten a, a good, clear answer. Um, the places where it impacted the, the lake the most was in the clear water, um, hmm. the water that stayed real clear. It didn't really get up into the river six, s- systems that much until recently. Um, so there's a lot of different factors. Was it the clear water? Was it the fluctuation? Is it the substrates? A lot of different um, factors as to why it took so long to get here and why it exploded You know, during that, that time period. But um, the, the impact to the dock owners is... I guess it's a, a smaller factor. It's more that it, you know, was, you know, that the, that it was an invasive species and we wanted to try to control it. We didn't realize that we were going to eliminate it, but we definitely wanted to control it. And, you know, we it, did. It, it, you did. Yeah. <laughs> In a perfect world then, like, would you want like 2% lake coverage or 3%? Like if, if you had your magic wand. 
in a perfect world, um, I'd like to have all, you know, native vegetation around the lake or, or have it, um, at least mostly native. Um, not to say some hydrilla would be bad, but, you know, our stance that, you know, is definitely an exotic, uh, invasive species that we would need to be able to control, uh, around the lake. Yeah. So I don't know about a percentage, you know, duck hunters love it. Like I said, the bass mm-hmm. fishermen liked it. So it's, it's difficult to, to explain to people, um, that it is overall not beneficial, but, um, you know, going back to the, you know, just have it, you know, saying that it's an invasive species and trying to get rid of it because it, it can take over a lake if it's not controlled. And that was the main goal was to control it. So it wouldn't explode any more than it did. And then that's what, that's what you guys are, are with the university are trying to replant is hydrilla or is it a, a different vegetation? No, we were trying different vegetation. Yeah, I had a uh, chair, char, uh, um, just dip, trying different things to see what would work different lake levels and all. And, hmm. With with limited limited success, that I'm going to have to ask off the stream to see if I can get those people on from the university because that'd be fascinating. I've always been fascinated why you can't just grow it. Um, it's easy to kill it, but it's a pain to, mm-hmm. to make any vegetation grow back. And so that'd be a fantastic study to get into. Sure. When, when it comes to any dam maintenance, like this thing was built in the 1940s. Like how how long does it? I mean, last? Like how do you? maintain it like how does any of that work yeah so there's there's not necessarily a set life expectancy for a dam um but we do annual maintenance um annual inspections as well as more in-depth uh periodic and assessments and inspections that happen once every five to ten years um but to your point it's it's a large, large piece of infrastructure, um, both the concrete and the earthen dams that, you know, we are, we receive an appropriated amount of money from Congress every year to carry out not only the inspections, but any maintenance that may need to be done, um, to include some recent money for, you know, under the infrastructure bill that is allowing us to take care of some maintenance needs both on the concrete, but as well as the earthen structures. Um, Cause they do require constant, constant, you know, vigilant inspections as well as uh, maintenance to make sure that we maintain the dam in a safe and operable condition. How long does the inspection take? I know like, I think it was the Chesapeake Bay bridge is famous is like it, you start at the beginning of the year. And by the time the year's over, you have to start right back up again. It takes so long. <laughs> like, how, like how long does it take you guys to do that? So, you know, we have we have staff here that is looking at things on a daily basis. So that that's key to note as well. We have around 25 staff members here in the office that Billy and I work in that are biologists, foresters, park rangers. Um, And then we have about another 25 or so people that work at the powerhouse that are mechanics, electricians, electricians. that are looking at for those facilities down there. So between our team, we're, we're looking at things on a daily basis. So Mm -hmm. it's, it's always ongoing, but when we have an outside team, um, come in to actually perform the inspections, usually we can knock those out within a week. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, with, that's the only thing we're focused on for that week is going through doing the inspections, seeing what prior year reports, um, so those, those annual inspections and those that come up every five or 10 years, we can usually knock out in a week. Um, and then oftentimes the follow-up to those, you know, takes more time, some research uh, to make sure we're looking at everything correctly and appropriately. That's insane. That's insane. And, and then I think that ties into like really the, 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 the thing we talked about earlier with the fish ladder thing. Um, it, it, is that something that is still being... I guess talked about heavily as something in the future, not saying that it will or will not, but it's still a, a, a contested subject. Yeah, it, it hasn't, it hasn't been a focus. Okay. I'll put it that way. It's been something that gets discussed. Um, you know, really for us, it, what Roanoke Rapids would do and what Gaston would do would be heavily dependent on what we may ultimately do here, because obviously if, if they're not able to get past those first two yeah. dams, there's not a whole lot of reason for, for us to be investing the money here at, at car. Um, so that's a, that's a big part of it, but 
more so than looking at fish ladders, we've always taken steps to try to improve the fishery downstream um, through our water releases. Um, so the striped bass spawn in the spring, you know, from April to June, we our releases from this dam focus heavily on that spawn, um, the fish coming up river as well as the transport of their eggs. So our releases focus on that during the spring. We focus on dissolved oxygen during the summer, trying to make sure we're maintaining that an adequate level below the dam and down into Gaston. Um, it, as you know, hot summer months, dissolved oxygen can become a problem for a fishery. So we focus in on that. When we did a major rehab of the powerhouse in 2010, the turbine, uh, the turbines that were put into the powerhouse were vented. Um, so they huh. actually create dissolved oxygen as they're operating, generating hydropower. That is so um, cool. Who the heck so, thought of that? <laughs> yeah. So, so those, you know, we take those steps that we think can have an immediate impact downstream of us huh. um, versus something like a fish ladder, which is a discussion, but requires several more steps to happen before it mm. becomes a reality or realistic. Hey, Bill, I'm going to toss it back to you. You mentioned something about the duck hunting. I n never knew that was a big thing on car. I really didn't. That's really cool. We, you know, um, it's, I've duck hunted for a number of years. Um, and when I first started hunting car, it wasn't. And for, I don't know, five or six years, it really exploded and it has become extremely popular around the lake. Now it's, it's, you know, there's, there's a lot of swamps, a lot of backwater, a lot of areas on the river that people can access. And I think, you know, Google earth, Google maps, when they really started getting, the aerial photography uh, and people started researching that through uh, Onyx and things like that. It really uh, people really saw what the you know what the reservoir had and uh, the the benefits of the reservoir and you know the amount of waterfowl that actually use the lake is is incredible. And of course, it fluctuates year to year, but you know typically you know you can have pretty good success here at the lake. I guess it's a chicken or the egg question. You said the last couple of years, was it like an increase of waterfowl that made it a hot destination or was it more of like promoting it? Like wh which came first to where it, it took off? That's, that's a good question. I want to say it was more, um, the access to, uh, the, uh, imagery and things like that. People started finding these swamps, you know, locals knew about them. But now you can get online and, and look and find backwater and people started finding it, started hunting it and started uh, accessing it you know, even more. Um, and it really, you know, became a pretty good resource, especially for waterfowl hunting. I've never like the idea. So, you know, growing up, you know, Shenandoah, the tidal Potomac, like I know there's a ton of people that, that hunt tidal water. The idea of hunting on a lake next to, you know, J Timmy and Susan's hundred thousand dollar house. Like, is there zones that they're allowed to do this in? Like, how does that's got to make your job a nightmare too? Well, you know, you, people think that, you know, there's docks everywhere on the, around the lake and there's, you know, the, the, the shoreline zones, you have three different zones. We have a green zone, which allows docks and then the yellow zone and then a red zone, um, which outline the wildlife, the wildlife management areas and areas in between uh, the red and green. That's where the yellow zone is not to get into weeds on that, hmm. but there's, there's really not as many docks as you would think. It's a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, land out there really uh, uh, protected, isolated. Um, you know, we try to manage it that way. So people can enjoy docks in areas where there's, you know, subdivisions or there's places like that around town and things like that. And then there's a lot of, you know, areas that are, you know, pretty remote, you know, that uh, take, you know, hike in or a, a boat in to, to access. So we, it, it's pretty diverse as far as the uh, structure of, of the project. That was literally going to be my next question, because you look at a Lake Anna and the houses are on top of each other, like, you know, New York City. Like, were these zones created back in the 1940s or is that something that was, I guess, newer that the idea of putting these zones in? Well... Go, Michael, you go ahead and touch yeah. on Yeah. Yeah. So th the zones that we have currently are something that would have probably come about um, in the 70s more okay. so than back when it was originally. But the master plan, our master plan for development around the lake has always included areas set aside for recreation purposes versus uh, shoreline activities. Um, 
or preservation for cultural historical resources that may exist, as well as what Billy mentioned earlier, you know, wildlife management areas, um, which we have 26 of them around the reservoir. That's, that's so cool. Yeah, I was I was actually reading a, a book this week just about all the, the different lakes in the Carolinas too. And Kerr was in there about like just the flooded villages and then the trains and things like that. And it's so, it's fascinating because then you keep remembering like, yeah, this thing was built in the 1940s. And I don't think a lot of people that show up there with their bass boat appreciate like the history that went into this and just the enormous undertaking to build this thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And to your, and to your point earlier, um, you know, we had to acquire a lot of land, you know, 50, 55,000 acres of land around the reservoir because we are a flood control reservoir. We have 20 vertical feet of flood storage. Um, so, you know, if, if we were, if the lake were ever to get to three, 320 feet above mean sea level, you go from having a 50,000 acre lake to roughly an 83,000 acre lake. So, Holy shit. you know, it's, uh, yeah. that, that 20 vertical feet spreads out across a lot of property. And that's why we had to acquire property around the, around the lake in order to prevent from flooding private property, um, and houses that we're ultimately trying to protect downstream. Is that have to do also, I just like with Smith mountain Lake, is that built into the cake? Like if there was a dam failure there, it's coming downstream. So this is how much land we need as well. And then gas in the same thing. Yes. I, I won't say that that's uh, calculated in for Gaston dam, um, the private power dams, but if, you know, dams above us, above John H Carr, if they were to fail, you know, one, it would take a long, it would take a while for the water to get here. So we would have True. some notification. Um, but we would be able to handle those events, um, you know, especially with the notification where we could start draw down before the water even reached, reached this area. Hmm. That's fascinating. That that's absolutely mm-hmm. fascinating. Is there, and just to put just to put a pin on the, the land around the lake, is there anything coming up or will it ever be, Will the lines drawn on the map be flexible where you could see in the future there will be more homes and docks on the lake? Or will it keep this pristine rural nature and that's just how we want to keep it? Yeah, to, to Billy's point earlier, you know, with the zonings that we have, um, those have held steady for a while now. We review them um, once every five years to see if there needs to be any changes. But we try to mean that um, one third one third of the shoreline is designated for uh, docks and private. When I say private use, they have access to their docks. They can put in paths, those kind of things hmm. down to a private dock, but it's still public land. Anybody's allowed to be on it. And then you have protected shoreline, which usually has an, we're, we, we're protecting it for aesthetic purposes to maintain that natural landscape around the reservoir or it could have historical or cultural resources. And then we have another third designated for recreation, recreational development, um, which is our state parks, our federal parks, um, and other partners, other partners that have uh, recreation to include five marinas um, provided on the lake. Is is that much of an issue when it comes to pleasure boaters? So example is um, Deep Creek Lake. I'm, I'm going to be getting another episode here going about that about lake erosion with wake boats and you look at a lot of these smaller bodies of water that's not an inland ocean like like car is but you know you have that issue with so much pleasure boating it does it might be a cause for for erosion is that something that you're you're seeing at Kerr or it could be a problem in the future yeah uh, you know of course we're a man-made lake so erosion is has always been a factor and you know with some of the boat traffic and so and just an increase in boat traffic can in, you know increase that erosion rate that we've always anticipated and planned for um and of course weight boats weight boats can uh have a bigger impact than just your normal pleasure boats but i don't know that we've i don't know that we've seen a significant increase in erosion based on any one user group um you know really oftentimes our flood events where we rate where the water comes up quickly and we try to pull the water down quickly to get back to our guide curve, our target lake level. Sometimes that can have a bigger impact on erosion than anything, just because you have a saturated shoreline, you then pull the water off of it. So there's no back pressure anymore. And then you'll start to have sloughing and so forth. Um, so that, 
that can have just as big an impact as anything as far as recreational activities or otherwise. That's interesting. That's really fascinating. Uh, Billy, what is the catfishery like nowadays? Because I know back in the day, uh, how many state records have you had pulled out of there? Almost world records. It's insane. That's right. That's right. Um, You know, just since I've been here, the catfishing um, popularity has exploded. You know, it was all bass fishing for the longest time. Of course, you know, the crappie were right there with them as far as uh, popularity. But the catfishing is just exploded and it's uh, it's a plentiful fishery right now. I mean, it's everybody's out and it's, you know, it's very popular and everyone's having a lot of success, uh, hmm. especially with the blue cat and in the rivers with the, the channel. I mean, with the, uh, the, the flatheads. What is the primary forage for them right now? It's going to be your, your shad, your threadfin shad, your gizzard shad, things like that. I would say it's your, it's your primary L-wise, things like that. So um, they're, and the shad, it, you know, is just as popular as, uh, and just as plentiful as ever as well. So um, there's no shortage of uh, forage for the fishery. You, you mentioned L-wives. Is, is, that, is that a distinction between an L-wife and a blueback? I think so, yes. I've always called them L-wives. I've always known them as L-wives. I'm not sure if they're the same or not. I'd have to look that up. I know they look kind of the same. Just want to make just just, just to confirm that we're talking about the same. Yeah. So L wives that makes that makes sense because they're more of like the deep clear water area, if I'm not mistaken. And then your other species will venture farther up in the river. Correct. That's right. That's right. Flathead. I never even knew you guys had flathead. I knew about the blueback or the blueback the blue cat fishery, but the flathead yeah. is yeah, the new. flathead in the river is extremely popular. I mean, a lot of people go after them. They they get pretty big, and it's a it's exciting fish to catch without a doubt. And then the the other thing that you know puts car on, uh, car on the map is the striped bass fishery that you have there. And it, one thing in the literature I was reading, it was a little bit probably outdated. Is is this a a spawning population or self reproducing population or not? Oh, it is. Okay, it is. They do stock uh, the game department does stock uh, the lake, but it is one of the natural one of the few. I guess I don't know how many there are, but one of the few, few. man made lakes that, it, that that they do spawn. They they go up uh, to Brook Neal in that area and and uh, do spawn, and that's that's when I personally go striper fishing is is at that time when they're up in the river and uh, and, and fish for them. Then that's that's a lot of fun. One for every hundred casts, they say, but you know sometimes you can get them to them better than that. Sometimes it less, but it's a good time in the river. Why do you think? Because I, I I just remember. I think it was in Fisherman uh, 10 years ago said it was like Lake Texacoma and, and Carr were like two of the few that actually had a self-replenishing population. What is it about this lake that allows that to happen or your best guess? I want to, I mean, my guess would be the distance between the next dam, um, you know, hmm. the stable population to lake distance between Smith Mountain Lake and up in Brook Neal, the, the substrate gets real rocky in the Roanoke River. It gets, um, uh, to where, you know, they, they congregate and can lay eggs there. I want to say that those factors are the reason why, but that would be more of a guess than anything. That's interesting. Yeah. I just, th- these mystical questions that no matter how much money you throw at it, you still don't know whether it's the SAV or, or why Striper decide to spawn them. I know, um, you know, Halleck, a huge shout out to you in, in Northern Virginia at our front Royal fish hatchery. They're just figuring out how to get small mouth to spawn, which has been a nightmare to figure that out. And it's just so interesting. Even in 2023, there's still things that we're trying to crack the code on. Mm-hmm. Um, sure. you know, and the last thing I really, I just wanted to, to, to hit on was, um, is there any kind of a structure things like Christmas tree, uh, f- that you put into the lake or anything like that man-made? Yeah. Uh, you know, we used to have a, a Christmas tree program, um, that we would, uh, set out, um, you know, places to, to collect the trees. People would drop them off and that really dropped off in the past few years where it got less and less and less and less, but something we started doing with the game department or the. Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources. I always call them the Game Department. I, you know, they changed the yeah. name a few years ago. It messes and, me up too. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, game wardens now, but they're conservation officers and all that. But uh, one thing we started doing, probably, um, I guess, 2019, is we've uh, bought these Mossback fish structures, and we started mm-hmm. putting them out in a lot of different places. Um, and talking to the biologists uh, um, in Virginia, they say they're the the ones to use, uh, the ones to get. So we've been purchasing those and putting them in places where the hydrilla was taken away to 
try to get a little more structure, a little more man-made structure in places. And we've gone all over the lake now, Nutbush to Butcher's Creek, started getting up into Bluestone and things now. So we're trying to put this everywhere, trying to to put these structures back to provide a, um, you know, more of a more structure for the fishery and for people to uh, to to use and to enjoy. Yeah, you know, thank you so much bo- to both of you for your time today. Um, I mean, we, we've touched on so many things. Is is there anything else or closing thoughts or anything that's coming up that you would like to promote that people can, can I can link in the episode description so people can find? Well, I mean, uh, you know, we have a multitude of boat ramps, multitude of campgrounds that are run by us, run by Virginia State Parks, run by North Carolina State Parks, and there's all kinds of access, you know, you know, please, you know, feel free to call up here and if you have any questions and, you know, feel free to come enjoy the lake and, you know, definitely be safe when you're out on it. You know, if you're going to be fishing or boating, you know, wear a life jacket and just come have a good time. And if you have any questions, we can give our number and they can call up here to the visitor assistance center and have, have their questions answered. Michael, Billy, thank you so much for your time. I know you, you two are super busy. I really appreciate it. Again, guys, link in the episode description to everything we talked about today. Please like and subscribe to the channel. We are the number one fishing show in the greater DMV metropolitan area. We'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.